Hey, um, well, welcome to our talk, A Year in the Red. Um, it's tough being the first talk of the day, particularly when there's uh, beer sides the night before. So uh, thank you for all who were there last night for making the effort to come down this morning and listen to what we've got to say. Um, so what is our talk about? Well, um, for probably the next 45 minutes or so, we'll be t discussing some of the advances in red team tactics that have come to light over the past 12 or so months. Um, we've tried to cover a broad range of areas, starting from the out closer. Is that better? <laughs> starting from the outside with uh, recon and infiltration, through to establishing C2 lateral movement. And um, we'll talk about some of the things that we found most interesting, including the tools and techniques um, released by other researchers, as well as some of the tools that we've developed and uh, that have proved useful to us during our engagements. Um, most of the tools that we'll talk about we have released. Um, we gave a, a slightly different version of this talk at um, SteelCon a couple of months ago, and, and we kind of released a lot of the tools off the back of that. But you can find them all on the, uh, the MDSEC Active Breach uh, GitHub page. Um, so my name is Dominic Chell. I work for a company called MDSEC. Um, I have overall responsibility for the company's Seabest and Star uh, Red Team Services. Uh, this is my um, third Manchester B-Sides talk, so I guess I must be doing something right because they keep taking me back. Yep, I'm Vincent Yu and I um, work alongside Dominic on the Active Breach team at MDSEC. Uh, this is my first B-Sides Manchester talk. <laughs> um, so from our perspective, over the past few years, we've really noticed much more focus being paid to red team exercises. Um, particularly over the past 12 or so months, we've had a lot of more clients coming to us asking us about red team exercises over traditional penetration testing. Now, I'm not exactly sure why that is, but I suspect it's to do with buying from the regulators. So we've seen the development of structured frameworks that provide a more formal approach to conducting red team penetration testing with backing from regulatory authorities. So we've now got things like the CBEST scheme, which is backed by the Bank of England. We've got the TIBA scheme over in Holland, which is backed by the Central Bank of Netherlands. And we've got the ICAS scheme over in Hong Kong. Um, so like yin and yang, as red teaming becomes more prominent, so does blue teaming. Um, advances in defensive controls, the wider adoption of sandboxing, um, technologies such as Microsoft ATA, LAPS, um, device and credential guard, as well as the rise of threat hunters, that is people who are proactively and iteratively looking for um, threats within an organization, are all making red teaming considerably harder. So as such, red team tactics must evolve. And that was really the inspiration for this talk because we believe there's been some really interesting developments over the past 12 or so months. So I'm gonna pass you over to Vin who'll talk about some of the advances in reconnaissance. So the traditional um, sort of like reconnaissance that like you perform on a red team is mainly to profile a, say, a target, an organization. You might try and find details such as, um, you might try and profile the employees, you might try and look for their infrastructure on the internet, um, things like that. So, um, um, but here I'm gonna focus on um, email collection. So um, I guess a lot of the time on our reconnaissance activities, we want to obtain a list of email addresses for a target organization to be used in um, activities such as password spraying on the external infrastructure or um, even um, spear phishing. So email collection has traditionally been performed using um, uh, search engines such as Google and Bing, social media like Twitter and Facebook and um, LinkedIn. And you can probably find them, um, if you're lucky, you might find an email on Showdown. So, um, Traditionally, email collection is performed um, using tools like the Harvester, Recon NG, um, but we found some issues with these sort of tools. Um, so here I'm gonna focus on LinkedIn and explain why we're looking at LinkedIn. So if you look on the, um, the right-hand side here, you can see, like, you can see the, um, the employee's name, the organization that they work at, their sort of role and title, and their um, geographical location. So this will be um, of interest if you're um, trying to scope down an engagement to a specific region. And more importantly, it allows you to search by organization. So if, we, um, if you actually just type in an organization name at the top, you can actually navigate to their company page. And then after, when, after you click on that page, um, you can see that there's actually a box that allows you to um, and there's actually a link that says, see all 106,000 employees on LinkedIn. So when you click on that, you'll have a list of all of that organization's employees. Um, so the issue here was that although there's this useful um, access on LinkedIn, 
most of the tools that we found were broken, either due to um, pre uh, the new UI updates on LinkedIn, or it was based off of um, using a API key. Um, so we, we um, created a tool called LinkedIn to sort of overcome this. Um, the idea of LinkedIn is to streamline the collection process. So ideally, if you're on an engagement, all you want to provide is a target company name, a domain maybe, and you know, a few minutes later, you hope to get a, a large list of emails that you can um, potentially use without too much faffing around. So um, the scraper is actually based off um, Danny Crastell's scraper. Uh, we basically went ahead and fixed some of the UI updates and also added email format prediction using the Hunter um, uh, recruitment API thing. Um, so here's a quick demo of the LinkedIn tool. All right, so we begin by running the LinkedIn tool. So this is what you would see. Uh, I'm using General Motors as, as a test case here. Um, start filling out the sort of like questions and then um, I put generalmotors.com here. Um, I quite quickly realized that that's not the right domain and Googled a bit and it's actually gm.com. So I'll fix that. Um, I put auto here to perform the email format prediction. It finds that it's first.last at domain.com and then it begins scraping. So here you can see that it's actually skipping a lot of headless profiles that it's found. A headless profile is basically a profile that the current account that I'm using cannot see because it doesn't have a third um, degree connection to that target. So to improve like the sort of results from the tool, you can use a, an account and begin connecting with employees within that target organization. So if you manage to connect to someone that's quite popular within that organization, then you can see a lot more of their employees. So these are the sort of formats that are available. There's a HTML format uh, in, in the form of like a report for easy browsing. Um, includes like their um, title uh, and their region. So that's good, but it's um, not like useful if you're gonna put it into other tools. So there's also a CSV format. So this allows you to then just highlight the emails column, or you can even do filtering on location, like the United Kingdom, and then select um, specific employees to be put into um, other tools which we'll um, talk about next. So now um, I'm gonna pass it back on to Dominic to talk about infiltration. Um, so infiltration is uh, sometimes one of the hardest parts of a red team. Um, Traditionally, there's been a lot of focus on things like phishing, um, but the blue team is really kind of wise to this tactic. So unless you're creating particularly low noise targeted uh, spear phishing campaigns, there's a good chance that you might get spotted. So we were particularly interested in other vectors for targeting corporate networks aside from phishing. Um, although sometimes I do have to admit, it may just be as simple as creating a carefully crafted email, uh, sending it to your target and asking them to run a Python command on the uh, terminal of their MacBook, as poor old Colin found. But to, to our dismay in this case, we found ourselves giving Colin tech support because the uh, version of Python OpenSSL on his Mac wasn't compatible with our payload. <laughs> um, so there's been some really interesting developments in targeting exchange environments for the past 12 or so months. Um, there's been some impressive tooling released, uh, tools such as MailSniper, uh, Ruler. These can all be uh, used to target and perform password guessing attacks against Exchange, and in some cases inject arbitrary OWA rules to gain code execution on a work user's workstation. Um, so with that in mind, we started to think about other kind of exposed um, AD connected, AD integrated services. One of them that kept cropping up for us was um, Skype for Business. Um, but unfortunately, we couldn't find any real kind of research or tools on how to attack these services. So we started to kind of investigate this ourselves. So Skype for Business, or Microsoft Link as it was formerly known, uh, typically comes in one of two flavors. And that is either an, an on-site, on-premise um, Skype for Business server, or a hosted server um, using federated authentication. So you may have something like integrated into Office 365, for example. Um, 
Fortunately, identifying whether an organization is using Skype for business is relatively trivial. Um, typically, there is um, DNS entries because the service supports auto discovery. So what you'll find is um, there'll be a DNS entry such as linkdiscover.the company's domain or linkdiscoverinternal.whatever the company's domain is. Um, if those uh, DNS entries don't exist, uh, you, it's quite trivial to find the, the service banners are quite distinctive, so you can find them on things like Shodom. Um, so we were kind of interested in how widespread Skype for Business was. Um, so we ran a quick DNS enumeration of the Alexa top 1 million. Um, and what we found was that roughly 26% of them were using it. And of that, 3.7% were using Office 365. <laughs> now, um, as I mentioned, because um, Skype for Business integrates into AD, we believe this might provide a, a kind of additional opportunity to ID identify AD credentials from the internet. But unfortunately, there are no tools really around to communicate with these services. So what we went on to do was develop a tool called Link Sniper. Um, so Link Sniper was basically a, um, a tool that we created that was allow us to um, perform authentication to um, Skype for Business deployments. Um, when we started to kind of uh, investigate how the authentication uh, or what kind of types of authentication Skype uh, handled, we found out it supported NTLM, Kerberos, and OAuth. Um, we basically opted to uh, go down the route of OAuth, really, because it was the most simple to use. So what we found was it was as simple as creating a, um, a post request with um, a grant type of password and then supplying a username and password and sending it to the service. This is obviously after you've done the kind of auto discovery steps. Um, but given the service supports um, NTLM and Kerberos, um, there is also potential for doing things like um, pass the ticket or pass the hash type um, attacks against uh, Sky for Business. Um, we started to look um, at how Office 365 did authentication. Unfortunately, it didn't actually support the kind of OAuth um, uh, method that we'd, we'd kind of already implemented for the on-premise servers. Um, Office 365 actually used a WS Trust and RST authentication. These are the kind of core uh, protocols used by uh, Microsoft Security Token Services and ADFS. Um, but what we were able to do is actually, uh, this was quite well documented on MSDN, and we were able to implement this into our, our kind of link sniper tool, so it supported not just on-premise service, but also Office 365. Uh, and eventually, we were able to create a tool that could perform password spraying and password brute forcing against um, Skype for Business deployments. Um, so I'll give you a quick demo of the tool now, and you can see how it works. <laughs> So, um, so essentially the tool is uh, based on a PowerShell script and um, all I'm doing here is uh, just, just proving that I've got some users in my uh, text file. Uh, and then there's a PowerShell commandlet called invoke link spray, um, which you supply at the list of users, you supply a password to try, and it will basically test that password against all the users. Um, initially, it will do all the auto discovery steps. It will find out where all the service endpoints are, and then it will attack them. So you can see in this case, we've been able to actually find uh, a valid user called joe.blogs.mdsec.co.uk with a password of welcome1. Um, obviously, we don't actually use Skype for business, so this, this account doesn't exist anymore, but you're welcome to give it a try. <laughs> Um, so you can find Link Sniper on our uh, on the MDSec uh, Active Breach um, GitHub page. Um, so while describing um, Skype authentication, I briefly mentioned um, the concept of federation, but I didn't kind of explicitly explain what it was. Um, so officially, it's a way, or Microsoft describe it as a way of um, providing single sign-on across trust boundaries. Um, but unofficially, it's actually a way of exposing Active Directory to the internet, which is, is pretty awesome from a kind of offensive perspective. Um, so essentially, what it allows you to do is um, implement federated services, things like Skype for Business, things like Exchange, uh, integrate them into Office 365. Um, but it also allows you to share the identity of someone within your organization um, across trust boundaries, so with trusted business partners. So that might be from one domain to another, for example, um, company A to company B, or it might be company A to Microsoft themselves, maybe if you're using something like Office 365. So why is this interesting and why is it relevant to Skype? Well, when we started looking at attacks against Skype, what we kind of discovered was that um, there was this really interesting option in the Office 365 admin panel. Um, so you can see on my um, screenshot up here, uh, I've got this external communications tab, and there's a simple tick box which says, let people use Skype for business to communicate with Skype users outside of your organization. Um, 
So what does that mean? Well, it basically means that if I'm a company and I've got external communications on, um, it means that any other user who is using Skype for Business and they've got federated authentication can actually just go ahead and talk to users within my organization. Um, so this is pretty good if you want to do things like maybe um, targeted or directed um, spear phishing via uh, Skype for Business IM based messages. Um, we can also do things like user enumeration. Uh, we can get a list of the contacts within an organization. Um, we can also get presence, awareness of presence, that is whether a user is online at a given time, which could be useful if we're doing something like a physical red team exercise. Um, so what we actually went on to do was uh, go and create, uh, we created a new Office 365 account with a, uh, a username of Skype support. And um, we can see on the left-hand side, we've got the, um, the attacker screen. So this is what the attacker would see. And he's basically sending a message to the Joe Blogs user saying, oh, there's a new Skype update. You really need to download and run this kind of executable. Uh, and on the, the, uh, the right-hand side, this is what the Joe Blogs user would see. You can see all it says is Skype support. We've got a service announcement and providing him a link. Um, so I, th I tend to think that's relatively kind of convincing, but if the user, the only kind of real hint that it's not from within that organization is this option up here where it says external network. Now, if the, um, if Joe Boggs was maybe kind of wise and he uh, went to look up the contacts, what you would actually find is the, the email address for our Skype support user. But in this case, what we actually went on to do was we managed to find a Microsoft domain that had just expired um, and we went and registered it. So we have actually got uh, Skype.support at a, a recently expired Microsoft domain. So hopefully that would, uh, and we've used this on a number of red team engagements and it's been relatively convincing. Um, so moving on from infiltration, um, but in a similar kind of area, I'm going to talk about some of the things we've seen uh, developed from um, a defensive evasion perspective. That is tricks that have come to light for evading specific security products or blue team monitoring tactics. Um, so as the first line of defense, the corporate web proxy, provides a really good place to firm up your defenses. Um, and it's one of the controls that we often see organizations implement or, or introduce is um, limiting the sites that can be accessed through the corporate proxy through the concept of categorization. So a lot of companies consider categorization to be a security boundary. We don't. Um, and you'll find out why. So um, what categorization does is it will effectively um, black hole any sites that aren't categorized. So um, maybe you want to um, limit your users from only visiting maybe like financial government sites, for example. You can do that with categorization. Maybe you want to stop them accessing sites of a certain genre, so maybe such like adult sites or sites containing profanity. Again, you can do that from categorization. Now, this can be a problem during a red team exercise because it means that our phishing site or our command and control site ultimately needs to be categorized. And if we're creating a new domain, it won't be categorized. Um, so the typical approach to this has been using tools like Cat My Fish or Domain Hunter. So what these tools do is they will search online and find expired or recently, uh, expired or recently going to expire domains. Um, and basically it will allow you to go and purchase these domains or snipe them. Um, and these are domains that have already been categorized and you can use them because they're, they're kind of safe uh, categorizations. Um, the, the downside to this is really that it's hard to find target relevant domains um, or maybe typo squatted domains. So say for example, um, we're targeting like Bank of America, we might want to register a domain like Bank of America, like VPN.com or something like that because it would kind of add authenticity to our um, phishing campaign. Um, but the problem with this is that that domain wouldn't actually be categorized. Um, so what we started to do was research how categorization was performed and um, how proxy sites were actually uh, determining what category a site should go into. Uh, and we, we found a number of kind of flaws in this process and we ended up developing a tool called Chameleon. Um, so what Chameleon allows you to do is basically take any given host and categorize it against um, whatever category you want for a, the supported types of proxies. And at the moment it supports um, Bluecoat, uh, McAfee, uh, and IBM X-Force, which are some of the, the kind of the biggest proxy sites. Um, but not only that, what we found was that the domains didn't actually really have to exist. Um, so we can see up here we were able to categorize evil dot I really don't even exist what the fuck dot com uh, as banking and now any user who's using uh, IBM X Force thinks that that is a banking site um, or we were able to categorize uh, foo dot com as uh, again finance and banking and any user who's using any of the McAfee products um, for a proxy will think that this is banking 
Um, so that was pretty useful. So I'll give you a quick demo of our uh, chameleon tool. Okay, so I'm basically just um, creating a new DNS entry. So you can see I've literally just created c2. Dot, I think it's apt1.info. Uh, and just to prove that it now resolves, uh, I'll just do a quick uh, look up on it. So you can see it's got an IP address. So I've literally just created that host. I'm now going to run uh, Chameleon, and I'm going to tell it to um, categorize this as, as banking. So what the way it works is basically we found in um, the way Blue, Blue Coat does its categorization, we found that if you cloned a certain site and you made some subtle changes to the, the actual content on the site, uh, Blue Coat would be fooled into thinking it was the same category as whatever the primary site was. So in this case, we cloned uh, bankofamerica.com. We host, fired up a web server, and uh, you can see Blue Coat now thinks it's financial services. Uh, and uh, the, the, the kind of we can go, go on and verify this by just going to Bluecoat's site because it is instant. And on Bluecoat's site, you can verify what category for any, any site is just by popping the domain in. And you can check the rating, and we see now Bluecoat or Bluecoat services think that c2.apt1.info is a financial services site. So we can now go on and use this in our kind of phishing and, and kind of c2. So I'm going to uh, pass you over to Vin, who will talk a little bit about sandboxing. So traditionally, antivirus has been um, heavily based off of um, signatures and known signatures in its um, way to um, detect um, malicious content. Um, there might be some heuristics, but I don't know how successful those have actually been. Um, you know, last night I was just trying to bypass um, Nod32, and that was quite trivial. It was just a, an hour's work or whatnot. So. Um, the idea of a malware sandbox is to uh, perform automated malware analysis on a target file that you, you're not sure whether it's uh, malicious or not. Um, this also allows organizations to start bringing these capabilities in-house without actually having to um, hire um, the expertise in, because then you, you just need to buy an appliance per se. Um, so what this does is it will execute a fi file within a controlled and isolated environment the idea of it being isolated is that it shouldn't connect out to the internet, shouldn't be able to communicate uh, with anything on the internet. But, um, you know, like say virus total sandboxes will connect out to the internet for whatever reason. So, you know, you can then start looking for issues within that sandbox to key off of and not execute within that sandbox. Um, but that's a, another issue that. Um, so what it will do is when it executes it, it will examine what it does when that file is executed and it will look for malicious indicators. So malicious indicators can be, um, it's outside of my expertise, but um, usually it looks for stuff like writing to registry, creating new services, connecting out to um, target domains and um, yeah, it sort of observes the traffic. Um, so we're going to do a quick case study on the um, popular uh, my FireEye, oh, what's happened here? <laughs> the popular FireEye malware protection system. Um, so the uh, web MPS and the email MPS. So um, in a lot of organizations that we've come across, um, usually the issues with deploying a sandbox is due to the architecture, design, and um, configuration within that specific environment. Um, so <laughs> yeah, and it also sort of depends on the the appliances that you might have bought. So with FireEye, I think they have loads of different types of appliances. And um, I looked on the website. If you want to um, SSL decrypt, you have to buy another SSL decrypting appliance. So if you've got the cash to splash, then it'll, it'll probably work out OK for you. But if not, then you'll start having um, some holes in the security even if, after you buy one of these um, appliances. Um, another thing we came across was the number of limitations with um, like sandboxes in general. Um, but here we're going to talk a bit about like, FireEye's limitations. So in terms of file types, it does um, sandbox the uh, regular binaries, such as um, XCs and libraries, so executables and libraries, and the Office malware documents. Um, so your, um, your regular .doc, .doc, um, dot, um, doc .m, .xls and .xlsm, and maybe PowerPoint files as well. Um, also, it will take archives and extract um, binaries to sandbox these, um, these files within it. Um, it will also sandbox shortcuts. Uh, what we found was that 
well, at least from our observations over a long period of time now, is like it doesn't sandbox HTML applications and it won't sandbox JavaScript files. Um, so you can basically send a target a HTML application or run a um, like stage off in PowerShell or something, and it's and it will just um, let that file through anyways. Um, it, this is mainly due to what I think is because it doesn't know what to do with these file types because it's not being written into the sandbox. Um, additionally, um, FireEye appears to use um, predefined guest images, so I'll have a look in the um, like web interface and. There's limited configuration options, to be honest. Uh, looks on the website, it says like they roll out new um, guest images every month or so. I don't know how um, how true that is, but yeah. And um, so the issue with predefined guest images is like if an attacker gets access to one of these appliances, you could trivially um, reverse engineer these guest images and start looking for variables that you could key off of and um, begin evading these sandboxes. Um, because everyone then shares these predefined, same predefined guest images. Um, other than that, you could also pro pretty much guess lot the sandboxed image. So, like, say if it's a Windows machine and underneath, um, it wouldn't be domain joined. And because it's predefined and you can't modify it, then you can't necessarily domain join that um, particular image onto um, your domain. And if it's not domain joined and you expect the target to be um, on the domain, then um, you can basically do a, um, a domain joined machine check sort of thing to bypass this um, sandbox. Um, so other than sandboxes, we've come across a, a lot of um, security operations centers it's beginning to look at process spawning. And so in particular, what I mean is um, um, by process spawn chains, I mean like process child re uh, process spawning relationships, like parent to child. So um, say if you were in command.exe and you're spawning notepad.exe, you might see like command.exe spawning notepad.exe. So um, here are a few examples to explain what I actually uh, mean. So, um, so if a SOC analyst began to see mshta.exe spawning powershell.exe, then it might alert um, on the fact that um, Empire and Cobalt Strike and Metasploit Frameworks payloads in HTA will actually um, do this sort of... Um, Spawning. So um, in a uh, Metasploit's, um, let's see, what form? Yeah, it's HTA PSH. That format will um, um, basically, when you execute the HTA, it will spawn in the MSHTA container and it will basically just run a PowerShell um, stage. Um, other than that, command line login seems to be a thing now, like quite popular. Um, so you, like, um, SOC analysts might look for words like dash encoded command or any substring of like dash encoded command up to around dash enc. Uh, long PowerShell commands might be a suspicious indicator because um, say if you're a developer in an organization, you might not necessarily be running really long PowerShell commands over a command line. You might actually just run, um, you're more expected to just run PowerShell.exe and start working from within that. Um, so now for a few bypasses. Um, um, so if they're looking for dash encoded command um, or any substring, quite um, regularly I have seen this in some environments where um, the dash ec um, shorthand is actually um, overlooked because it's um, it's not a substring. So um, that's probably something that like if you're on the blue team, you should probably uh, make sure you're looking out for as well. Uh, and if you're on the red team, it's probably safer to use that instead of the dash encoded command. Um, if you're using the regular ASCII dash in your payloads, um, so you know if we're using like a Western keyboard, we'll type dash and we'll get this um, short dash. But if you actually open up the character map and look for um, uh, Unicode character two zero one five, it will um, be a slightly longer dash, and that gets um, interpreted the same way as the um, regular dash. Um, there's actually a few more dashes that you can use that are also Unicode, but I've just um, labeled like one here because um, yeah. So um, so what if you're looking for like words like or commandlets like invoke expression or invoke web request? So invoke expression, if you don't know, is to basically execute a a string uh, um, which will um, get passes like PowerShell basically. Invoke web request um, does a, a HTTP connection or HTTPS connection to the internet and then downloads a um, a, uh, a, a like a file. Um, so I've got a quick proof of concept up here. Yeah. This one here, which um, basically sort of like bypasses some of these sort of um, checks if you were looking for those keywords and commandlets. Um, so what this does is it spawns PowerShell within PowerShell uh, and um, then spawns calc. Um, so 
the um, the nslookup.exe um, list bit and the and list domain cal.vincentu.co.uk um, will basically do a DNS text record lookup for um, um, that domain, and uh, the result will be calc.exe, which will then get passed into list dot notation, which will execute that binary, and um, yeah, then basically this just pops calc on the screen. It was just a quick proof of concept. And then um, Daniel Pahanan earlier on in the year um, released um, Invoke Cradle Crafter. Um, this does the um, Invoke Web Request type um, lookup, but obfuscates it. So what um, with traditional Cradles, um, you know, it's likely that there's all these signatures for these. But if you um, take a target uh, PowerShell script on the internet that you want to stage off of or execute, then you can pass it into Invoke Cradle Crafter and it'll spit back out a obfuscated um, cradle that you can copy and paste to execute on the machine. So now, what if um, mshta.exe was spawning PowerShell.exe? Um, so how do we overcome that? So Matt Nelson um, has actually made me aware of the SWBEM locator com objects where um, you can instantiate this com object and basically use it to create the PowerShell.exe um, um, stager. Um, so what this does is then it uses WMI to spawn the process and then it basically, instead of mshta.exe uh, spawning PowerShell.exe, it will be um, WMI PRVSE.exe spawning PowerShell.exe. So if the defender's not looking for that as well, um, this might um, sort of bypass um, the, the range of checks that they have. Um, Additionally, we um, created a tool called PowerDNS, well, Dom did more specifically. Um, <laughs> so uh, what this allows you to do is, if we go back to that proof of concept where using the um, NSLOOKUP.exe to do these, this DNS staging, you could actually do a full staged, um, like say, if you wanted Meterpreter or something, you could stage Meterpreter entirely over DNS. So say if you send the target a payload and they receive it by email, but they don't have internet access from that target machine, but they have um, recursive DNS and, and external uh, lookups um, configured, then you could use this to stage that DNS payload entirely over um, um, DNS and get, in, uh, get command and control on that machine. Um, so... Um, yeah, so traditional cradles are uh, potentially blocked by proxies and filtering, but DNS is a, another story. You can't really categorize the DNS. You probably, there probably are um, more advanced DNS um, sort of like servers nowadays, but not that I'm aware of. So DNS has actually uh, been quite common as a egress filtering type, um, egress channel sort of thing, uh, but um, not necessarily for um, staging payloads um, over. So um, Dom's created this tool, and let's um, have a quick look at a demo to show you what he does. OK, so basically the way the tool works is um, it, well, when we run it up here, it actually gives you your uh, your download cradle. You can see it gives you a very short PowerShell one-liner that you can just uh, pop into like something like a HDA file. You could obfuscate it if you wanted to. But um, we've got an example HDA here, which I'm going to run. Um, and it will basically execute the download cradle. And when it runs, you can see it generates a bunch of DNS requests. So in the first block, um, we actually create like a staged... Um, a stage payload which uh, is retrieved by the download cradle, then executed. And then that basically tells it the order where all the other um, blocks from the PowerShell script are, and then it will retrieve all those blocks via DNS uh, and implement them in memory without touching disk. And you can see up here, we've actually made it create, we've got like a, an implant back, beacon implant back on our uh, Cobalt Strike command and control. Um, so that basically gives us a way to completely avoid doing any kind of DNS requests and we can maintain everything over, uh, sorry, web requests and we can maintain everything over DNS if we wanted to. All right, so now I'm going to talk a bit about um, command and control and the sort of advances around that. That's not Vincent, by the way. <laughs> Thanks, <man. laughs> Okay, so the topic of domain fronting has sort of been um, quite popular over over the past uh, months and half a year sort of thing. Um, 
So for those of you that don't know, domain fronting um, has been traditionally used by services such as the um, the Tor um, service, and, and um, it basically it helps um, bypass censorship issues in certain countries. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into it, but in our um, specific um, like our research, we looked into the CloudFront content delivery network. Um, so that's um, Amazon's. And uh, what this allows you to do is. Uh, connect to any Amazon Edge node and specify a host header for a, a target instance. So if it's my malicious instance, then if I connect to that Edge node and say I want to get data from my malicious instance, then it will grab data from my instance. So uh, I put it into more context. So if you connect to, say, a0.adrestatic.com and give it a host header of myinstance.cloudfront.net looking for um, cat.jpg or something, then um, the cat.jpg might not exist on a0.adrestatic.com, but it exists on my instance. So when you do this sort of request, it will be able to actually grab the content from my instance um, and get like cat.jpg. So moving on a little bit, um, so from right, so even though a 0 com gives us um, you know more of a trusted domain to use, um, you can there's actually um, C name records that I found so and that you can use with CloudFront. So if you're an organization, you probably don't want to be using uh, random GUID.CloudFront.net as your um, sort of like content delivery um, domain because um, it doesn't look that good, right? And then. Um, so you might want to use like say Bank of America dot uh, um, Bank of America dot com or something. So I went ahead and just um, scanned Alexa top one million for CNAME records. Um, I came across around roughly fifteen thousand in my first scan. Um, so yeah, it's quite um, it's quite a large list. What's more interesting is um, a lot of these sort of organizations use it. So we've got financials like API dot com that you can use. Um, there's um, some government entities in the USA, uh, so that's pretty good if you know if like organizations only allowed to um, read government websites um, for the uh, proxy, for for example. Um, so let's um, so there are a few shortfalls with um, domain fronting. It only works if the proxy is not RFC two six one six section fourteen twenty three compliant, which basically means that like, um, when you specify type domain that you want to grab data from, the proxy is supposed to rewrite that request and um, fix the host header. We found one like anomaly, um, the Sophos web gateway. When I tested it, I, I was not expecting it to work, but for some reason, like Sophos just doesn't rewrite the um, request. And um, yeah, and if you go on the admin panel, it actually thinks that you're connecting to like say, so I was using cdn.az.gov, the Arizona government, and yeah, it thinks I'm talking to the government website when it's in fact a C2 channel. So. Um, this can also be quite useful if you've already infiltrated the organization and you want to set up this long-term um, covert communications channel um, because it'll be less, um, you know, like someone might suspect, uh, less suspect a government website to be the C2 channel. So after you've already infiltrated, it's quite easy for you to then perform internal recon to determine whether um, you can actually use domain fronting through like, a specific web gateway. Um, and also, if there is no root CA installed on that machine, it's probably quite unlikely that the um, the proxy will be able to um, SSL inspect that traffic. And if it can't SSL inspect it, it, it might work both ways, but if it doesn't drop the packet and it routes it through, then your, your sort of like the integrity of your packet is um, maintained and it'll, it'll work as well. Um, if it doesn't, if it decides to drop it because of the configuration, because it can't inspect that traffic and it doesn't want to let it out of the organization, then um, you're out of luck there, I guess. Um, so here's a quick demo of domain fronting. So on the left here, I'm doing a DNS cache. Um, list just to show that there's nothing there. Then I run the domain fronting payload. You see a DNS request for cdn.arizona.gov. And then you can see it on the left in DNS cache now. And then, um, yeah, basically you can use as many domains as you want in one payload. You can just basically rotate between them. So you can have like a thousand domains or something. And um, yeah, if they start blocking one or two, you know, they have to go for the whole 1,000. Um, that was um, just doing something on the left there to prove this two-way C2 and it's all functional. Um, so yeah, 
just delete that. And then um, I go ahead to, and list it by D, um, DNS, and I can see like there's different um, there's different IPs basically. Like it resolves to each one resolves to a different edge node, and you've got more IPs to beacon out to as well. And a quick look at the sort of contents. Um, it's connecting to probably Arizona.gov, and then it actually specifies my particular um, CloudFront instance. Um, so a bit about lateral movement. So <laughs> right, traditionally, um, there's like the PX exec, the WMI, the PowerShell remoting, the COM exec, the RDP that you can use for um, lateral movement, but not like, say, through um, he heavily tight like net firewall networks. So I've got a bit about uh, a tool that I wrote called RDP Inception. It abuses the fact that a lot of people mount their, um, their disks in RDP sessions. So you expose a backslash backslash TS client backslash C directory. And um, basically what you do is you put this proof of concept into the startup folder of the RDP session that someone's RDP'd into. Um, and when they log in, it will infect the host machine. And when the host machine reboots, next time you'll get a shell on that host machine. Um, so basically this worms up and infects. Um, sort of out of time here, but um, I'll speed up a little bit. And then, um, so here's a sort of scenario. Um, systems admin is RDPing into the management jump box, which then for some reason is RDPing into the domain controller. And then the domain controller is RDPing into a file server and then finally into a compromised database server. So if we start deploying the RDP inception on database server, next time he logs in from file server with drives mounted somehow, it will infect the file server and then start worming upwards. Um, so it's of interest because the database server might not be allowed to connect back out to anything at all and only um, 3389 inbound onto the um, database server. So this sort of allows you to um, jump past that gap. Um, so a quick survey on Twitter of cybersecurity related people, around 50% said that they actually mount their drives to just give you an idea of how applicable this is. Um, going to pass you back on to Dom. Um, so I'm going to very quickly just quickly talk about a tool called Bloodhound. Um, we couldn't really, it's one of my favorite tools, couldn't really talk about kind of advances in red team tactics without kind of mentioning. So um, this tool was released in uh, about a year ago. Um, essentially what Bloodhound allows you to do is um, use graph theory to provide kind of visual mappings of AD environments. Uh, not only this, but you can use these mappings to basically identify paths for privilege escalation um, by looking at the relationships between different nodes. Um, so what do I mean by this? Well. Let's look at an example. Let's say we fished a user called Alice. Alice is a member of the, the help desk group, and the help desk group is a, a member of a group called support. That may not necessarily be immediately obvious to us, but Bloodhound will actually figure that out by um, analyzing all the kind of uh, relationships between uh, AD objects. Um, and let's say the support group actually has admin rights on the SharePoint server. And at that current time, there's a domain admin with a logon session on the SharePoint server. Now, that is a very uh, useful path for escalation, um, which may not, as I say, be immediately obvious to us. Um, but Bloodhand will create something that looks a little bit like this. So up in the top hand side, we can see we've got the Alice user, and we can see Alice is a member of the group called Help Desk. Uh, and the help desk group is a member of the group called, uh, I think it was support, and support has got admin rights on the SharePoint server, and the SharePoint server's got a DA session logged on. So um, we can basically use that information to very quickly um, go straight to where we want to go to and, and escalate privileges. Um, so Vin actually went on to automate some of this, and he created a tool called Angry Puppy. Um, so what Angry Puppy does is, it, well, it's basically a Cobalt Strike, uh, Cobalt Strike aggressor script, um, which will import some of the uh, JSON um, output from Bloodhound, and it will basically automatically execute the Bloodhound attack path, um, and it will pop you a um, an SMB uh, beacon implant on each of the compromised nodes uh, until you get to your target node. Um, so we'll give you a very quick demo of the the Angry Puppy tool. Um, so here's uh, an attack path. Um, yeah, so like, we've already determined that we want to use. Um, we export it as a JSON file. Um, and then um, save it. Then um, we go into the Cobalt Strike sort of um, terminal, um, type in Angry Puppy. And we can then select the JSON file that we want to <coughs> execute. 
So the um, the attack path that we want to execute and the type of um, pivoting that we want to use. So I'm going to use SMB. So um, yeah, and then it will go ahead and just execute this attack path. There's only two hops here, so it won't take too long. So it's executed the first hop. It then goes on and grabs credentials, like it knows it should be on that box, and then uh, determines whether it needs to pass the hash or use uh, make a token. Then it uh, moves on to the, the final box that we want to get onto, and then it tells you that the attack path's finished. So, yeah. so you can pretty much use Angry Puppy to streamline a lot of the um, kind of post exploitation process when on a kind of red team engagement. Um, so, but it, but it didn't really stop there for Bloodhound. Uh, in May this year, they uh, released a major update, which now included um, access control lists as an attack path. Um, so basically, Bloodhound will now map out all the kind of ACLs that protect all the relevant AD objects, so all the users, the groups, and computer objects in an Active Directory. And it will identify misconfigured uh, access control entities um, that can be used for an escalation path. So it will find things like the, um, the force password change attribute, which will basically allow you to change the password of a target user uh, without actually knowing their current value. So it might be like functionality that's used for like a help desk, for example, where they can reset all the user's passwords. And we can obviously use that, if we compromise one of those accounts, we can use that um, misconfigured um, ACE to basically compromise any other user within AD uh, and escalate privileges pretty quickly. Um, it will also identify things like uh, the generic rights attribute, which basically uh, gives you the ability to update uh, any kind of non-protected target object's parameter value. So for example, there is a, a script path parameter, uh, which you can, if it's misconfigured, you can basically um, modify, which will allow you to um, control the command or script that will be executed the next time a user logs on. Um, so aside from Bloodhound, there was also some um, relatively interesting active directory research performed over the past 12 months. Um, the thing that really stood out to us was the work that was done by uh, Ben Campbell, Will Schroeder, and uh, Benjamin Delphi. <coughs> so essentially at the heart of this research was the concept of Kerberos delegation. Uh, that is the ability to um, give a service a token that allows it to impersonate another user. Uh, and in order to do this, the, uh, the service account needs to have this um, trusted to authenticate for delegation flag applied to it. Um, <coughs> but to avoid the kind of concept of um, unconstrained delegation, that is where you've got a ticket granting ticket that allows the server to impersonate any service or machine on the domain, which is obviously a bad thing, Microsoft introduced the concept of um, a service for user to self or S4U to self. And S4U to self basically um, implements an additional AD attribute, um, this MSDS allowed to delegate to, um, which basically dictates the specific services that a token can be used to authenticate to. Um, so what does this mean from an offensive perspective? Well, effectively, if we're able to compromise a computer or user object that has this trusted to authenticate for delegation attribute applied to it, then we can impersonate any AD user to that SPM. Um, research done by uh, Alberto Salino from uh, Core Security basically highlighted that um, it wasn't just the specific services that we could compromise, but we could actually compromise any service that was running as that given target user. And ultimately, this often leads to full host compromise. Um, there were then uh, kind of major updates to the PowerView, Kecko, and Iron Packet toolkits, which will basically allow you to request the relevant tickets and go on and actually exploit these issues. Um, so, kind of wrapping up, um, what's next? Well, the past 12 to kind of 18 months have been pretty exciting from a red team perspective. Um, advances in blue team tactics have really kind of meant we've, we've needed to evolve. Um, personally, I think we'll start to see a lot more research in uh, defensive evasion. Um, you know, as organizations start to adopt Windows 10 more widely, we'll probably see uh, more device guard bypasses, more attacks against credential guard. They'll probably come under much closer scrutiny. Um, hopefully we'll uh, find some um, additional kind of AD research, um, hopefully uncover some more hidden gems like the S4U uh, research that I just mentioned. And then I uh, kind of generally speaking, I expect the area of red teaming will grow further, um, perhaps with um, more sector specific frameworks kind of similar to um, CBEST, TIBA and, and ICAST, but for, for other sectors. Um, 
So finally, just uh, thanks to all the kind of researchers that we kind of mentioned during our talk. Um, I would go and follow some of these guys on Twitter if you're kind of interested in red teaming. They, they kick out a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, if you're interested in any of the tools that we talked about today, uh, here's the link to the MDSEC Active Breach GitHub page where you can uh, pretty much download them all. And that's it. Any questions, please? No questions? No questions? Excellent. Thank you very much.